Okay, hi Bartonella buddies. I am actually really excited to be here with Dr. Mark Pimentel. And um, I think reading off of a bio by me is going to be mind numbing. So instead I'm going to have him uh, introduce himself. Hi, I'm Mark Pimentel. Uh, very nice to get to know you and also your audience. And uh, I'm the executive director of the MAST program here at Cedars. MAST is a discovery program where we try to figure out new things for the human microbiome to help diagnose treat and and try to make people better so that's what i do here at cedars now yeah and you have your pimentel lab still too yeah so it's all bundled into the mass program so the pimentel okay. lab is just uh, just uh, what cedars uses to break down the different people at the, at the institution but yeah we're all part of mass Great. I've done basically 10 videos on SIBO and EMO, and it's mostly based on your research. Instead of going over like the very, the very beginning basics, I'm going to direct my viewers. I'd like you guys to go to the video description box below. You can watch that if there's anything in this video that um, is new or confusing. What percentage of patients with SIBO and EMO don't present with typical IBSD or IBSC because you know a lot of your studies are done on like those perfect definitions. Yeah, I mean, so uh, the typical symptoms of SIBO, regardless of whether you characterize it as IBSD or IBSC, um, and to be honest with you, the whole notion of IBSC and IBSD is really sort of an old way of doing things because in the old days. Uh, in the 1990s, if you didn't have Crohn's, you didn't have ulcerative colitis, you didn't have uh, something else, celiac disease, for example, then you would be bucketed in this IBS category. So IBS was always the leftovers, and and and, and then it became defined by criteria. But but the reality is the question will be for the future is SIBO it's really its own entity and we really don't don't need to talk about IBS in that way and IBS is still sort of the empty the the bucket uh, of leftovers but but the typical symptoms of SIBO are bloating after you eat uh, changes in your bowel pattern usually irregular bowel pattern and sometimes it's constipation or diarrhea so uh, but yeah there are patients who don't fit the the typical category, for example, of IBS. Maybe they don't have abdominal pain, which is required for IBS. Maybe they don't have diarrhea. All they have is just bloating. So there are some atypical patients, but the breath test tells you whether they have SIBO or not. I guess what percentage don't have any like lower GI symptoms at all? So it's just upper GI. And I guess there is post-infectious functional dyspepsia, correct? And that would be, is that like the, that's the upper GI? Right. And, and there are new studies that just, just have come out in the last year and a half that say that SIBO is present in a good percentage of people with functional dyspepsia, even in the absence of IBS. So you have to sort of look for SIBO whenever you have this after eating, sort of this pressure or distress from pressure, uh, bloating, you know. But, you know, uh, everybody sort of, you have to explain sometimes to patients do you have bloating? And sometimes they say yes or no, but do you have distension from the bloating? Do you have to loosen your, your, your pants as the day goes on because you're just getting full? Uh, those things are very typical of SIBO and, and we have to get more specific when we ask patient questions. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I did see a functional GI doctor and he brought up SIBO and I was like, I don't think I have SIBO, I just have a lot of belching. And he said, well, the gas has to come out somewhere. Um, so he was right. He wasn't very nice, but <laughs> do you have any, um, hypotheses as to why some people present maybe with only upper or why some people have like upper GI symptoms versus lower, or it does it have to do with whether it's like in the proximal small bowel. So, yeah, so, uh, couple of things there. First of all, when when we do the, the new IBS smart or the blood test that measures the anti CDTB and anti vinculin, which we do in all of our patients with these symptoms, these functional symptoms that we're talking about today. When you have the anti vinculin antibody, it damages the nerves 
nerve cells that are responsible for moving things through the gut correctly. The early damage is a loss of cleaning waves, which brings on SIBO. The later damage is more muscular function of the gut. So you, you, at the extreme, you could have no muscular function of the gut, which is called uh, um, visceral myopathy or pseudo obstruction. And those patients have the highest antivinculin antibodies. Why am I telling you all this? Is because you can have positive antivinculin antibodies and the vinculin is more attacking the upper gut than the lower gut for reasons we don't quite understand. Um, a, a study came out recently saying that in people with gastroparesis, they often have a higher antivinculin and that higher antivinculin predicts lower numbers of those special pacemaker cells of the stomach. So they're not having IBS, they're having more foregut or upper gut symptoms like a dyspepsia or a gastroparesis. Uh, the trying to understand why it's more affecting the higher gut versus the mid gut versus the lower gut in some special cases is, is a mystery still, but something that needs to be solved. In your newest lectures, there's that little diagram. And so on the left-hand side, there's the IBS-D, so the diarrhea, and it's driven by either hydrogen or hydrogen sulfide associated driven microbiomes. And then the methane side has the constipation. And then along the bottom, it says like increasing microbial diversity. But so I have a, a couple of questions about like this new diagram. So Previously, there was, you know, there's a diagram of like hydrogen sulfide being associated with diarrhea and methane being associated with constipation and then hydrogen not correlated with any symptoms necessarily. That doesn't mean you don't have symptoms. Um, but I was, so I was wondering now, since the hydrogen seems to be on like the left side with the diarrhea, is, is hydrogen a diarrhea associated uh, thing now? So when we see hydrogen alone, it's a, it's a marker for SIBO. So if you cross that threshold of 20 parts per million, it means that you have SIBO symptoms, bloating and all these other things. But we could never correlate the height of the hydrogen. So if it's 20 or 40 or 80 or 100, it never correlated with bloating or with pain or with any of those sorts of symptoms. However, uh, hydrogen sulfide does. But, but basically this uh, diagram that you're describing is uh, a reflection of a paper we presented at DDW, which we've identified IBS as three microtypes, uh, a not a lot of hydrogen sulfide, a lot of hydrogen sulfide, which is more diarrhea, and then the methane, which is separate, but it's not, there, there isn't like chasms between each category, it's sort of a graduation between each. So uh, if you're leaning Far right, yeah, it's going to be extremely different than the far left, but there's a grays in between where people can be symptomatic and sometimes they can have mixed patterns. So, um, yeah, that's why it's a continuous diagram of diversity uh, on the bottom. Yeah, and that um, diagram, on, like with the diversity, it says that the lowest diversity is on the diarrhea side and, and there was increasing microbial diversity when, when you go to methane. I guess I'm wondering, is that increasing microbial diversity good or is it just different? Well, uh, now you're speaking to the philosophy of the microbiome. So if I... Oh, well, I okay, we can skip that. That sounds too... No, I love philosophy. But, uh, <laughs> I just... but so... Okay, so if you have Crohn's disease, you're having diarrhea every day. And one of the big findings is Crohn's disease is lower diversity. Well, if I put you on a laxative every day and you had diarrhea every day and I measured your diversity now and then a month from now, it's going to be lower because you're washing everything out. Mm -hmm. So the problem with diversity is that it is a marker, but it's not a cause and effect. So we know that having higher diversity is usually associated with a healthier microbiome but we don't know if too much diversity is bad or i mean that those things haven't been philosophically or scientifically proven yet uh, but what we can say is that when you're having diarrhea and the hydrogen sulfide is there it, the diversity is less but we know from the small bowel studies not this study you're quoting that the higher e coli and klebsiella are which are the hydrogen producers the more they're destroying the neighborhood. They're reducing diversity 
they're they're uh, they're like a, a tearing apart the the natural fabric of the like microbiome. Weaves. Weaves yeah, weaves the garden. Garden. Yes. yes, exactly. Yeah. And then in your lecture with SIBO SOS in June, um, you discussed how once patients take rifaximin for SIBO, the diversity in the small intestine goes up, becomes significantly more normal, and this can happen in weeks. Um, and, you know, basically that like rifaximin is not going to uh, ruin you. Um, so I guess, is that from a study on the, in the mass program and or and can you share more info about that? Yeah, we're we're um, looking at all of our patients that have received rifaximin who we know were SIBO, and then have had two scopes to look at the juice of their small bowel. Uh, but what we see in some of the early data is that rifaximin is like a weed killer, so it's killing the weeds and the grass is allowed to flourish, and and it's. It's pretty striking to see that. Um, we need more patients to publish it, but we're already seeing that. And, and the reason I'm disclosing it is because one of the most common questions I get is patients want to be reassured that they're not taking a cataclysmic antibiotic or something that's going to ruin them or cause, uh, we know it doesn't cause resistance, but whether it affects the microbiome in the long term in a negative way, what we're seeing in the early data is it's the exact opposite. It's allowing the microbiome to flourish, which is very unique for an antibiotic. Yeah, and I guess, you know, you have a microbiome problem. And so the antibiotic is restoring more, you know, back to more of a normal pattern, it sounds mm -hmm. like. Um, so same sort of line of thinking. I, I frequent a lot of patient forums and, you know, a lot of patients are scared or skeptical about antibiotics and how they kill good bacteria. And, you know, the way I think about it, and you can tell me if this is right or wrong, is, you know, many antibiotics are broad spectrum. They kill both like good and bad bacteria. And I use these quotes because, you know, some become bad under certain circumstances or opportunistic. But anyway, but I, so I think of it as, you know, the antibiotics kill a, a, a wide array of bacteria, but your immune system is still there. It's still online. And so they're working synergistically and then you're netting in the black, not netting in the red. Is that an accurate way to think about it? Cause like if the, yeah, I don't know if that made sense, if I'm making sense. <laughs> sort of. Um, um, Ask it again, because I'm, that this, I'm still not quite exactly sure what you're trying to get to, so I apologize. Yeah, so uh, the antibiotics that we use for SIBO, they yeah. do kill good bacteria in the small intestine. It's not like those, uh, it's not that targeted. It doesn't only kill E. coli and Klebsiella. Right, okay, exactly. So then, so, you're, so then your immune system is also helping the antibiotics work out so that you're restoring back to normal. You're not just like, you know, chopping every chopping everyone down so that you are proportionally, you still have the E. coli and Klebsiella like is still high. It's just lower because you killed everything in equal proportions. Right. So the reason why it's not, you're not killing everything in equal proportions is because you also have your immune system and your immune system does kill what it's seeing as uh, abnormal or bad. Yeah, I think that that's true. So if I, let's use the weeds in the garden analogy or the weeds in the grass analogy. One way to treat overgrowth, which is the old way with broad spectrum antibiotics is you mow the lawn. So you're mowing down, chopping down the weeds, you're chopping down the grass at the same time. Um, the refactment, again, again, we haven't published this yet, but we're seeing this in the reimagined study. It's more like weed killer. And then the grass, which is your immune system, takes up the spots where the weeds were, not allowing them to come back. Yeah. Uh, or at least resisting their, their you know, returning to the grass. Um, and I think that that's true. Uh, we, we do see that. Uh, but one of the problems with rifaximin and some of these treatments is they can't get to where the bugs are very easily because sometimes they're tucked in different crevices and places where because rifaximin is not absorbed. 
So there's an opportunity to improve Rifaximin, which we're, we're, we're in the midst of doing. So. Um, I'm going to get to that. <laughs> I'm going to see if you'll, if you'll disclose anything yet. I'm not sure if you're going to, but I'm still going to try. But um, one other thing I see in patient forums a lot is I got SIBO from antibiotics. And obviously, you know, what you see in patient forums comes with all the caveats that anecdotes come with. Um, but that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So me, but maybe it makes sense to you. So does that sound like a possibility that an so antibiotic could give someone SIBO? Complicated answer. Sorry, it's going to be complicated. But uh, um, there was one study, and this is what people read about or, or talk about, where they looked at the development, now this is IBS, not SIBO, but the development of IBS in patients who had recently gotten antibiotics for something else, urine infection, you know, a cold or flu or whatever they got the antibiotics for. And what they showed was that the people who got the antibiotics three months later had an emergence of IBS, which they attributed to the antibiotics. Here's the problem. They looked at them right after the antibiotic treatment as to whether they had IBS or not compared to the control group. And the control group had more IBS in the group that never got antibiotics than the group that had the antibiotic. And then three months later, the antibiotic group suddenly had a few IBS patients. But what probably happened is some of the IBS, some of the patients in the antibiotic group had IBS, took an antibiotic, got better, and then the IBS came back or SIBO came back. Mm -hmm. That to me was the biggest flaw of that paper. But uh, the other thing is like a lot of people take antibiotics for food poisoning and we know food poisoning causes IBS. And in fact, taking antibiotics means the food poisoning was so bad you needed antibiotics. Uh, women frequently get urinary tract infections, but sometimes don't realize that the E. coli they got in their urine could have been from food poisoning. And maybe that was the trip off or trigger for irritable bowel syndrome. <clears throat> Pathogenic E. coli can invade the bladder leading to antivinculin antibodies possibly as well. And then you took the antibiotic for that, but what you actually got was a sort of a post-infectious IBS or SIBO from something that you thought was urine. You know, so you, you see what I'm saying? So the, the antibiotic story is complicated. And the other thing that people mention is that people who need antibiotics often, often need antibiotics because they have an underlying immune problem. And that's why they keep getting infections. And uh, so when you bundle that all together, I don't think you can say with certainty that antibiotics triggered it maybe their underlying immune system is the problem maybe the infection itself was associated with something else i hope that was sort of clear no yeah that makes sense and you know it doesn't make sense to me that if you have an overgrowth it's also a dysbiosis but like if you have an overgrowth how is an antibiotic going to give you an overgrowth <laughs> if anything because it's going to kill and bring that load down um but yeah that does makes sense. I guess one, one thing I think about is, you know, you can take antibiotics and that can allow C. diff to flourish. Mm -hmm. I didn't know if you could take an antibiotic, which could allow maybe E. coli to flourish, but then maybe it wouldn't, unless you had a motility problem already. Right. That's the problem. So you just said the problem because normal people don't get overgrowth because they have beautiful cleaning waves and everything's working functioning normally and you need two parts you need the e coli to build up but it has to build up in the context of your gut being slow for whatever reason uh whatever underlying motility problem is going on switching gears um are there studies in the works to find antimicrobials that um, attack methanogens, which are archaea and not bacteria specifically, um, at the MAST program? Yes. Anything, anything you want to say about it? <laughs> uh, I can't. But okay. uh, suffice, let's just put it this way. We, 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 are, we have things in the works that, that we think will work quite well. But mm -hmm. you know, everything needs to be tested. We had 
we've you know we not everything we do succeeds because you know we try things uh so i don't want to be over promising i think one of the biggest things i see on social media with respect to our work is why is it taking so long and the answer is it just takes long and you know it's it's not like there's a hundred groups in the country doing work on this area it's it's us and maybe one other so it's it's not a lot of people, not a lot of resources, and you know we do our best. Yeah, and um, in order to change guidelines, you need more than just one, hopefully one lab doing all the research because you want people to reproduce the same, the same outcomes sometimes. And exactly. So yeah. Um. So, is it about one in nine people get IBS out of, after food poisoning, approximately? That's correct. Okay, so I guess what are some factors that play into whether someone develops SIBO? I can think of a few potential ones: genetics, severity of infection in terms of their response, the infectious dose or load, the pathogenicity of the strain and/or species whether it's a foreign country or one's home country, and then underlying health conditions, both known and unknown to the patient. What Ooh, say you? you? Yeah. Do you really need me to talk? Because <laughs> you're giving all the, all the correct answers. You can uh, just put a cardboard cutout of you right there and you can just go take a lunch break or something. <laughs> yeah, or, or, or you speak and I'll move my mouth and you're just telling the answers. Um, but yeah, no, th those are the things. I mean, the, the severity of the illness, Campylobacter is the worst, Salmonella second, then Shigella and E. coli. So yeah, they're ranked. Uh, the, the, so the duration of the illness, if you go to the hospital because you're so sick, if you need antibiotics, which we sort of touched on before, and the obvious one, which hasn't been worked out, is why one in nine? What what are the other nine people got that I don't got, and in and why am I getting IBS? Is sort of a big question. Uh, and so genetics, yeah, probably a big role here. We just don't know what it is yet, um, and that's something we're working on. Others are working on as well, and then we'll have to stay tuned for that. But yeah, I think those are the main factors. Um, and then Campylobacter is worse because why? Like uh, what's the ranking there? Campylobacter is a more severe illness. Uh, Campylobacter can be can last up to a month. Usually, it lasts four or five. E. coli is like a it's a, like a, it hits you two days later. You're already feeling better. Everything's moving in the right direction. Campylobacter is a real slug. It's it's a it's a nasty organism. A salmonella is sort of halfway between. So I think it's driven by the toxigenicity of the organism and it's it, what we call virulence, its ability to make you sick. Um, and then uh, the CDTB that we study the most is the Campylobacter CDTB. That's, that CDTB, that particular sequence is even more provocative than some of the very minor CDTBs and the others. So, uh, and we know CDTB is probably what brings on the autoimmunity. Yeah. Um, and once, uh, oh, about, yeah, one's own country versus going somewhere else. Could it be that, it, uh, I don't know, it's more foreign, not just because it's in a foreign country, but I mean, maybe you haven't encountered that because it is in a foreign country. Is that possible or probably not? I think it's because the organisms are the same. I think mm -hmm. the, the so let's say you get food poison in the US, there's a tremendous amount of laws in place. And Campylobacter is a um, reportable illness, you can't if you get Campylobacter a positive test that's got to be reported to the to the local authorities, the state government, because they track these outbreaks, you hear it in the news all the time. We're trying to figure out where this E. coli came from, and then they find it's from lettuce because the CDC comes in, tracks it down, and then tries to take it out of the food chain so more people don't get sick. Other countries don't have that you know tight reporting systems like the U.S. So what happens is you get food poisoning, and you get this much Campylobacter instead of this much. And so the illness is more grave. And so I think that gives it more potency. So I think that's probably more it than they have something special on us in terms of food poisoning. Okay. Um, so once 
anti-vinculin antibodies go from positive to negative? Does a person have as likely of a chance of getting SIBO as someone who's never had it and never had those anti-vinculin antibodies? Or even without the anti-vinculin antibodies anymore, are they still at a relatively higher risk? And I guess that would probably depend on genetics. It may be, it might, but we just don't know that yet. Yeah, so I mean, obviously we have patients with SIBO who don't have anti-vinculin antibodies, and maybe theirs is due to adhesions in some cases, cases or some other reason for a slow transit. Maybe it's a medication, maybe they're taking morphine or dilaudid or some kind of um, narcotic that's slow. There's a lot of reasons for SIBO that aren't, that aren't uh, vinculin. But when the vinculin goes up, we rarely see it go down and it takes years so it's a very drawn out process uh, anti cdtb can go up and never vinculin we love those cases because the cdtb will will come down because as long as you don't get food poisoning again in two or three years the antibody disappears and your ibs goes away your SIBO goes away i have a handful of patients like that now which is the best kind of SIBO because my, my anti-vinculin antibodies were elevated and then I did them a year later and they were not elevated anymore so well, that means it's going down so hopefully it'll be a good thing I think I think it's a good thing I think I don't have SIBO anymore I just have uh, other shit <laughs> oh <laughs> other crap <laughs> I'll probably have to bleep myself now in uh editing <laughs> Well, they're saying, they're saying the the SHIT word, or they're saying shit in uh, the news now. I, even oh. last night, so um, nobody's editing that word out anymore. So we're moving further. You know, the the bar for censorship is going up. Well, you know, it's 2022, baby. No one can. I'm an adult. I'll say shit whenever I want. <laughs> <laughs> um. So what do you envision the treatment looking like for anti-vinculin antibodies? Um, well, I would love to be able to drag that out of the bloodstream because if I can get rid of it, I think I can make IBS go away. And I think that's, that's one of the things we're looking towards, but um, we don't have the technology to do it yet, but we will. I mean, I think we will. It's going to take a lot longer, uh, but it, it's, it's an important thing to do. So when you see, what, oh, go ahead. What I was going to say is, I mean, what people don't understand is we have to understand all the facets of IBS in order to find the cure. And that takes a lot of time. And so the cures have to, you know, you can find something that's a temporary, another temporary measure, another temporary measure, another temporary measure. But I think if we're going to make the impact we want to make, we want to get a permanent measure. And that just is harder work, more time. But we have the targets that's that's the beauty of this and that's what we're so excited about we know what needs to be done it, executing on that takes time so when you say draw it out of the blood i'm assuming not like specialized leeches <laughs> scientifically how would you draw draw it out of the blood? I mean, would it be some sort of biologic type of drug or? Well, one one could think of a biologic uh, and, and uh, a biologic agent, which would just rip that out of the bloodstream and take it somewhere else or, or pee it out or wherever it would go and get rid of the antibody. Uh, I mean, there's, there's a number of ways it could be done, but um, we... We just haven't figured out the best, easiest, least toxic way to do it yet. Um, it's tricky because if you try to take antibodies out of the blood, what you want to do is take that one, but you don't want to get rid of the COVID antibody because that's the one protect you, protecting you from COVID or the influenza antibody, which protects you from the flu or, you know, so we want to be very um, precise in what we remove. Got it. Um sounds difficult glad i that's not my job <laughs> um if a patient doesn't get on a prokinetic and you know they're a more severe case that would need a prokinetic do you see patients swing from one type of SIBO to the other like hydrogen sulfide to uh emo or vice versa so in 26 years of being at cedar sinai doing breath testing I think I have one or two cases 
where they were not emo and they're now emo. Emo, always emo. Um, and what I mean by that is I think emo becomes part of you. Uh, and, and I think the methanogens probably from your family, probably from living in the same house, sharing bathrooms, sharing food, sharing whatever the reason, way you get bugs from your family. Um, and then they become part of you. And it's only if and when those bugs decide to take off to a high level that you start to get these this constipation. But we don't see that on the other side. The other side, I've never seen somebody convert to emo who never was. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, but you can get rid of emo and become other things. So if you get rid of the methanogens to the point where they're gone, other things will take over. And we have seen that happen. The reason I ask is because that's what happened to me. <laughs> um, had the had emo and then wiped it out and then in came the hydrogen sulfide, but now, now it's gone. Um, so how often do you see MCAS in your clinic? What might be the relationship between MCAS and SIBO? If I had to guess, I would say it's bi-directional. Um, oh, and mast cell activation syndrome for anyone who's watching, that's what MCAS is. Yeah. Mast cell activation syndrome, a little tricky because the, the bugs of the gut, the bacteria of the gut can produce a tremendous number of chemicals that are very similar to the chemicals your own body produces, whether it be hormones or neurochemicals, serotonin, which of course is a chemical that helps it, you know, is used for mood drugs. Uh, and and um, likewise, histamines and other chemicals that can trigger or activate mast cells or eosinophils are present in the gut. And the question is, is SIBO causing the mast cell activation or is the mast cell activation somehow selecting organisms in, in the case of SIBO? So chicken or egg, we don't know yet, but we're studying it for sure. That That's part of some of the things we're looking at right now. Um, so stay tuned for that. I don't even have data that I could secretly say, hey, it's coming soon. Uh, we're, we're working on it and we will have data to tease people with probably because that's what we do all the time, tease yes. people. <laughs> yes, and I'm sure you drive people crazy. <laughs> not me, not me. I mean, <laughs> other people. Um, and <laughs> but other people. Other people. That the, other, are... <laughs> the other people, yes, the other. <laughs> the other people. Um, and then I guess with MCAS, you know, a lot of MCAS patients have bloating. I could see how inflammatory mediators that the mast cells release maybe could impair motility, which maybe could then lead to an overgrowth. Does that sound possible? Yeah, I mean, neurochemicals that are produced or, or these inflammatory chemicals definitely can change the muscle function or the motor function of the gut. And if they're chronic, yeah, you can get problems with motility. So, so again, this is the chicken or egg that we were sort of alluding to is that Maybe the MCAS is promoting SIBO, or maybe the SIBO is promoting MCAS, or both, you know, sort of working in tandem. Okay, well, I'm putting my early bet in, and I think it's both. We talked about biofilms earlier, but not really. And you always say, stay tuned. What roles do biofilms play? Are you going to say, stay tuned right now? <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, so is a biofilm good or bad? Is it bad if it's thick? Is it bad if it's thin? Is it protecting you from antigens from your food in terms of food allergies? Do you need a biofilm? Uh, are bacteria harboring in the biofilm? Are the bacteria in the biofilm the good type of bacteria or the bad type of bacteria? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. All of the above questions are important because people say, well, we need a biofilm buster, uh, but biofilms protect you you know they're sort of a barrier and so if it's good it's good if it's not good it's not good and and we're breaking down the secrets of the biofilm not necessarily breaking down the biofilm in all cases so i'll leave you with that okay so uh and then is there research coming out on that yes there is. And, and and when when 
Um, <laughs> let's say before spring. Before spring. Okay. You heard it here, folks. But I've never said before spring, so this is a new piece of information. <laughs> oh, yes. You've heard it here first. Wow. Um, breaking news. So sulfur sensitivity. It's kind of a controversial topic, probably because there's not that much info on it, really. And that's kind of what happens. Do you see sulfur sensitivity, meaning patient sensitive to foods high in sulfur in your practice? Well, um, specifically foods with high sulfur as sulfur is causing them problems or more we see that the sulfur is a fuel for hydrogen sulfide production, in which case you get the hydrogen sulfide effects. Hydrogen sulfide is um, toxic, maybe the wrong word, but is not is harmful to the cells of the body. I mean, if you if you had if you were in a room with 10 per parts per million hydrogen sulfide right now, you would die. Uh, and that's a small amount of hydrogen sulfide. Um, so you don't need a lot to hurt the body and it can affect the body. And, and the body tries to get rid of it because it knows that this is not a good thing. Uh, so more sulfur can mean more hydrogen sulfide if you have those organisms in your gut. So, Okay. Yeah, there's the hypothesis that sulfur sensitivity is due to H2S SIBO. Um, that hypothesis came out before we had the trio smart breath test. I guess now that it's out, practitioners could probably start seeing for real if there's an association, I guess, you know, I don't want to keep talking about myself because <laughs> that's not what we're here to do. But since I'm not a practitioner, I don't have a lot of, uh, patient experiences to draw from, uh, except my own and then what I read online. So I did treat my hydrogen sulfide SIBO into remission and I still have sulfur sensitivity. So I guess, you know, the question there is my N of one, my anecdote, what, what's that relationship if I treated the hydrogen sulfide SIBO and the sulfur sensitivity remains? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's I, I don't know. Um, yeah, haven't seen, enough, haven't seen enough cases to, to, to be able to sort of start to understand that. So. I'm not sure I have a good answer for that at this point. Um, and then on, on one of your slides, I think I saw it in the SOS lecture, um, you know, it says uh, dissimilatory and assimilatory sulfate reduction pathways um, with the H2S SIBO. Uh, could you explain what this means? Is it about bacterial metabolism? Right. So the the production of hydrogen sulfide can be done in multiple different ways, depending upon the category of organism. And so um, the assimilatory and dissimilatory pathways are just two different ways to get to hydrogen sulfide. So let me put it in context of methane. There's only one way to get to methane. And the bugs that produce methane generally use that one path. Uh, the reason we put that in there is it means that it makes hydrogen sulfide a little more technically difficult because there's not just one organism producing hydrogen sulfide like there is methane. There's multiple organisms that produce hydrogen sulfide. And why we identify two categories, the fusobacterium and the disulfovibrio, there are others, bilophila and, and, and many others. And bilophila, I like that. Bilophila. Bilophila. Uh, Bilophila, yes. Um, and so they, there are others that produce hydrogen sulfide that may be participating in this whole hydrogen sulfide story. So the hydrogen sulfide story is more complicated than the methane story. Okay. Um, and then I really enjoyed reading the study on the cytokines in the duodenal fluid of those with SIBO versus those without SIBO. And so um, just to tell any viewers, some of the findings were that uh, patients with SIBO were more likely to have certain cytokines elevated, including IL-1 beta, and then Klebsiella correlated with TNF-alpha, IL-6, and then m Smith EI also correlated with IL-1 beta. Um, and so do these cytokines indicate anything specific and how might they play into symptoms or pathophysiology? Yeah, uh, I think the most interesting thing in that study was that 
the methanogens correlated negatively with TNF, tumor necrosis factor. Tumor necrosis factor is the most um, angry cytokine, if you want to put it that way. Uh, it's the one that really provokes an immune and inflammatory response. The others were associated with TNF, but methanogens are anti-TNF, or at least they are, it appears, I'm not sure it's a cause and effect, but they're associated with a lower TNF which is interesting because we never see methane, almost ever, in Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, which are TNF conditions. Um, so begs the question, is too little uh, methane a bad thing? Uh, does it lead to other problems? And should we, we shouldn't look at, and I, this goes back to sort of the beginning of where we started, is that we shouldn't look at bacteria as good or bad. We should look at to them as balanced or imbalanced um, rather than this one is bad. Look, do you want lactobacillus in your blood? No, you want it in your colon. Do you want lactobacillus in your small bowel? Absolutely not. It's a disruptor. It's a weed when it's in the small bowel. So maybe probiotics are good for the colon, but they're not good for the small bowel. So um, you have to we have to understand the balance before we can see what's going to turn the balance in the right and good direction. So I'm, I'm not in, of the mind that we need apocalyptic things for SIBO or for these categories. <clears throat> I'm of the mind that we need to correct the situation, uh, not overcorrect the situation. Mm -hmm. And I think I, I read, I read a, an article, maybe I'll link it in the video description box below if I can find it. And it was just talking about, you know, it was making an argument to stop calling bacteria good and bad and went into that and is intellectually stimulating. Um, but back to cytokines, um, do you see uh, targeting cytokines as perhaps a part of treatment for SIBO and or IBS maybe in, I don't know, complicated patients? Yeah, so um, I've never been a fan of that approach in any disease, to be honest. And I know that probably smacks a lot of companies who are trying to use cytokines for rheumatoid arthritis and so forth. <clears throat> and of course, they work. Uh, they work for those diseases. First of all, the drugs would be extremely expensive. But the issue is in these microtypes, we see a different cytokine panel in each microtype. So we'd have to have something for each category. But the problem with the immune system is you block one pathway and another pathway goes up because you have, let's pretend hydrogen sulfide is inflammatory, right? So you haven't got rid of the hydrogen sulfide, but you're trying to block one of the cytokines trying to attack the hydrogen sulfide organisms. Go down, go down because you're, you're inflaming us. And then you block that pathway, but the body's still saying, well, this is terrible. This is terrible. Let's find another way to kill it and then it activates the other pathway. So the immune system of the human body is what we call redundant. So it has multiple ways to try to defend itself. If you block one way, the other way will go up and that can cause other problems. So I, I'd rather not prune the tree, I'd rather kill the root, if you know what Got I mean. It. No, no, it makes sense. And uh, it makes sense that the immune system's redundant or else you'd be effed because if, <laughs> One thing's not working well, well, then you're going to die. Um, and, uh, well, one, one question I had is, you know, uh, they found it in the duodenal fluid. I don't think you measured blood in that study. And I guess, would you expect those same cytokines to be elevated in the blood? I mean, I would expect maybe sometimes, but not necessarily. Yeah, I mean, we see similar patterns in the blood as we do in the fluid, uh, although the fluid is more concentrated, so you get a stronger reactive pattern. But uh, we, we do see that. It's, it's not too dissimilar. Got it. And then if it's showing, showing up in the blood, might it show up in the blood only in some patients and not others? And maybe that would indicate, I don't know, how much inflammation is happening? Yeah, I mean, we, we haven't gotten to the point where we could say, hey, we should do this as a blood test for patients with SIBO to see who's really inflamed, who's not inflamed. But, you know, those are the kind of things we can do with the reimagined study. 
uh, mm -hmm. over time as we continue to accumulate patients. And, and we do see patterns, but nothing that we could say, hey, you know, this person needs to be treated this way and this person needs to be treated that way. <clears throat> you know, we just don't have enough patients in the reimagined study to be able to subcategorize patients to that degree. I've read many papers and they say the gut microbiome in the title, and then you read what they're defining as the gut microbiome and its stool. And I'm going to tell you what I think. I think it's annoying. <laughs> I think it's, I think it's uh, incomplete. And I guess I was just wondering if you thought that like as a field, the microbiome researchers need to stop referring to stool as the gut microbiome and refer to it as the stool microbiome. Um, what are your thoughts? Because I just feel like it, it kind of, it downplays the importance of the small intestine and it doesn't give it its own spotlight. A hundred percent agree. A hundred percent agree. Because the gut is the mouth the esophagus, the stomach, the small bowel, and the colon. And, uh, you know, I think, I think researchers have always gravitate, well, st stool is easy to get. It's easy to get for anybody. Um, and because it's harvestable, you can't harvest the small bowel juice very easily. You have to be a gastroenterologist. So you have to have a specialized team that gets this material for you. So I, I think it's defaulted that stool is the gut microbiome, but it's not the case. You're right. It's absolutely not. We've, we've shown this in multiple studies and others have as well. So uh, you're right. We should stop doing that. I just thought of going back quickly to the hydrogen sulfide and you were saying about, you know, if there were 10 parts per million in the, the room, um, you'd be, would you be dead? You'd be dead or like knocked out. Yeah, I, think, I think the cutoff is eight. Uh, okay. So if you've got 10 kind of brewing in your small intestine all the time, what might that be doing to the small intestinal cells or any other cells it comes into contact with? Would it be creating a lot of oxidative stress? Would it be damaging the cells? So um, again, the human body is amazing and has an amazing ability to detoxify things. And I think in the case of hydrogen sulfide, the epithelial cells try to get rid of hydrogen sulfide. I know the liver is the next sort of, um, I guess the next wave of the military protecting you, trying to stop the hydrogen sulfide from becoming systemic. And then uh, the third would be, you know, breathing it out, getting rid of it through your lungs. And then hopefully by that, by the time you're past your lungs, the gut or the liver or the breathing it out has gotten rid of most of it and it doesn't get to the brain and doesn't get to the sort of the vital organs from there. Um, so I think that's how it's handled. The problem is if it's in the air in your room and you're breathing it, it's getting into the lungs, then going to the vital organs from there. So that's more damaging. Uh, but yeah, no, I think high hydrogen sulfide is is toxic and, and, and can damage the lining of the gut over time. Uh, mm -hmm. How it does that, we don't know. We do see some association between hydrogen sulfide and colon cancer. So anything that causes chronic inflammation in the colon can lead to colon cancer. And so that might be one avenue of the development of colon cancer. Um, and so maybe that's sort of an answer to your question is maybe hydrogen sulfide does cause those damages chronically leading to bad outcomes. Um, and then there's not a lot of like small intestinal cancer as far as I'm aware. I mean, no, that's have. correct. That's okay. correct. So we're still uh, in the midst of trying to figure out where hydrogen sulfide is most populated. So remember, we we had to redefine emo as intestinal methanogen overgrowth, not small intestinal methanogen overgrowth, uh, because it's in the colon. Uh, we're seeing a lot of these hydrogen sulfide producers in the colon, and maybe in the small bowel. But we have to we have to finish our research to define that. Okay, and when's that coming? You want to break any more news? Yeah, let's say six months. <laughs> okay, six months. Six months, folks. And then you can start asking him on Twitter. Just kidding. Don't, don't, don't harass him on Twitter. <laughs> um, please, please don't. Um, please, please don't do that. 
Um, so I don't know if this is a stupid question, but I'm going to ask anyway. Um, often when people go on a trip and they get food poisoning, they take Imodium because they don't want to be having diarrhea all over the place. And so, you know, all of our defense, uh, I don't know, like innate immune system things like diarrhea, it does help get rid of pathogens, but it also can be hijacked for the pathogen's own spread. Um, and, uh, so it, you know, it just depends. I didn't know if Imodium uh, could potentially make one more likely to develop SIBO if they got food poisoning. Yeah, so that that's, people believe that you should, if in doubt, let it out. Um, just let, because the pathogen will clear out if you let the diarrhea happen. If you don't, then you're gonna retain it for a longer period of time and potentially longer term damage SIBO, IBS. So like, we don't have a study that says, well, if you took a modium, you're more likely to get IBS. But I think theoretically speaking, and based on what we understand, that's potentially possible. Um, so I, I'm not saying I wouldn't do it. I would say better if you get food poisoning, treat it. Uh, treat it properly with antibiotics so that it goes away quicker. Because if it goes away quicker, we do know that might reduce the risk of IBS. Interesting. So instead of a modium, get an antibiotic when you're in the exactly. get we kill it because it the yeah. longer it's there the more likely you are to get ibs for the next 10 years or whatever so very very interesting and i guess maybe if you're on a trip and you're still like having diarrhea after several days maybe then you could take the emodium or no you just what should emodium just not exist i don't know well, no, I mean, look, if you're having incontinence from your diarrhea, you have to do something. You can't just, you know, be yeah. to a toilet. So, or if you're on a tour bus and, you know, you, you can't, that, if that can't happen. So Imodium has, uh, is useful in those circumstances, but obviously try, if you can, if it's convenient, try to avoid it. So to paraphrase Max Planck, uh, science advances one funeral at a time. That isn't exactly how he said it, but, um, and another one of my doctors talks about how it takes about 21 years for research to make it into the medical textbooks and then make it to the clinic or the bedside. And I was wondering if you had any sort of big ideas, how we can make this transition faster, of course, money, researching, education, but is there anything beyond that? How can we make it faster? money i mean but, <laughs> just so, money. Just well money. because no I, I don't mean it that way um so the nih really hasn't funded and ibs to any great extent at all i mean it's literally it, it's negligible compared to crohn's and ulcerative colitis uh we looked at this once and uh, ibs in a 10-year period got 10 million dollars from the nih that sounds like a lot of money except ibd which is 100 times less patients got 250 million in the same period of time so it's lobbying by groups and and getting the nih to pay attention to a very important disease and that doesn't happen with ibs or not to a great extent so mm -hmm. uh you know if we had 40 people working on this it would be faster mm -hmm. uh, we don't uh, because that requires a lot of a lot of resources but but that's not the full solution the other solution is that um you know, people have to be able to embrace new ideas. I always say this whole thing is not about me. This whole thing is not about the scientist. This whole thing was about the patient. And if somebody came to me tomorrow and said, I can cure those SIBO patients with this thing and it works, I'll quit and I'll do that every day because it's, you know, it's, and it's all about what, it, what works. And if it works, let's do it because we need to help our patients. So, um, that's sort of how my, my philosophy is. It's, it's not about the doctor. It's not about the social media. It's not about all of this stuff. This is just education to help people feel like there's an avenue for them that, that we're, there are people working to help them. But the bottom line is we, you know, patients need to get better and and if these diseases where people were ignoring it for such a long time need to be paid attention to and somebody needs to do the work so we're trying to do the work 
Well, I'm very thankful for you and your entire team, everyone that works there and all the work that you've done. And I'm also thankful that you came on my channel. And um, so thank you for the third time. Well, keep up the good work. You're, 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 you're spreading education in a way that makes it enjoyable to, to understand and understandable. So I really appreciate what, what I've seen of your work so far. So, thank you. Absolutely. Except for the few hate comments of people who tell me I'm annoying, but I hate to tell them I've lived with myself for 29 years tomorrow. It's my birthday. And I know I'm annoying. So well, <laughs> you can't tell me. <laughs> happy annoying birthday. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. And um, I'm going to hit stop recording now.